Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Carol Weil at the National Cancer Institute, and on behalf of our entire Enrich Forum team, welcome to today's presentation featuring Dr. Karen Liu from MD Anderson Cancer Center. As hopefully many of you know from attending some of our prior events, Enrich is NCI's speaker series focusing on ethical and regulatory issues in cancer research. A few logistical points before we get started. All lines have been muted upon entry and will stay muted for the duration of the webinar. If you experience any technical difficulties, please use the chat feature on the right side of the screen and contact the host of the webinar to assist you. You can submit questions at any time by using the Q&A feature. Please type in your question and select host before hitting submit. We will moderate these questions after Dr. Liu finishes speaking. While we may not get to all questions in time, we'll do our best to address them now or after the talk. If you require closed captioning, please refer to the media viewer panel. You will be asked to enter your name. And now I'll introduce our speaker and turn the floor over to her. Dr. Karen Liu is the J. Taylor Wharton Distinguished Chair in Gynecologic Oncology at MD Anderson Cancer Center. She is a national leader in the cancer genetics field and serves as director of the Uterine Cancer Research Program and principal investigator of the NCI-sponsored Uterine Cancer SPORE, or Specialized Program of Research Excellence. She is also PI for the Magenta Study, which is the focus of today's presentation, a study that is particularly timely in the COVID era designed to investigate the efficacy of remote genetic counseling modalities enabling the delivery of genetic counseling without requiring patients to travel to a healthcare provider. Before turning things over to Karen, I do want to note that the views expressed in her presentation are hers and not necessarily those of the NCI. Thank you. And now, Dr. Karen Liu. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and to participate in the Enrich Forum. Um, I'm looking forward to spending the next hour with you. I'm going to spend about 30 to 40 minutes going over the Magenta study, uh, and I really look forward to conversation um, uh, when I'm finished. Uh, and I have no financial disclosures. So um, even in my uh, career, um, there's been a revolution in hereditary cancer genetic testing. Um, and this is just a timeline that, um, that I put together. Um, so much of what I've done is in gynecologic cancers um, and Lynch syndrome uh, as well. And so in 1919, um, uh, Dr. Worthen, who was a pathologist, uh, described family G, which was the initial family um, that we now know had Lynch syndrome. And if you kind of look over the years, um, you know, I was a, a, a trainee in the 1990s, uh, and that's when um, all of our um, kind of high penetrant hereditary cancer genes uh, were cloned. Um, and then more recently, things have accelerated even more. So in 2012, uh, we really went from kind of a prevention space uh, to a therapeutic space, uh, and PARP inhibitors were. FDA approved uh, for the treatment of uh, BRCA-associated ovarian cancer. And then in 2015, uh, the FDA approved uh, immune checkpoint blockade. Um, and this was the first tissue agnostic uh, drug um, for MSI high tumors. Um, so things have really accelerated. And you can see kind of at the bottom uh, in the purple, you know, we talk about kind of the different eras, um, gene identification, uh, precision therapy, um, and we're really now into um, an era where we're, we're trying to uh, accelerate our access to genetic testing. And so I think the question for me as a clinician is, can this revolution in hereditary cancer genetic testing result in decreased mortality from cancer? So we're interested in, in the delivery of the care, but ultimately kind of our goal is to decrease mortality from cancer. So the topics for today, I'm going to give you a little bit of background about the Magenta study. I'm going to talk about the study design and some of the early regulatory hurdles. Um, I know that this forum is really around 
ethical and regulatory challenges. Uh, and so I'll, I'll briefly touch on those and happy to answer any questions around that. Um, the results were preliminarily uh, discussed at ASCO this year. And so I'll go over those. Uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about next. So as I said before, there's been, for me as a GUN oncologist, an incredible convergence of treatment and prevention. Um, so, you know, when I first started my career, I would say that cancer genetics was, you know, kind of a clinic that probably was pretty far removed from uh, the cancer clinic itself. Um, and uh, over the last 10 years, it's been, there's been this incredible and quite beautiful, in my mind, convergence of treatment and prevention. Um, so we know that when you identify the genetic mutation in the cancer patient, um, we now have actually treatment options that are specific for that patient. We talked about PARP inhibitors as well as uh, immune checkpoint blockades. Um, and, and when we identify those individuals um, who have cancer uh, with a mutation, this allows us to do the cascade testing. Um, and just a reminder, if our goal is to decrease mortality, we know that our greatest opportunity to prevent cancer is when the relatives test and then if they're positive, if they undergo preventive strategies such as preventive surgery. So we know that we're going to get our maximum benefit from this knowledge if we not only identify the patient, but we also identify the unaffected family members. And this is just a pedigree that shows that. So the small arrow is on an ovarian cancer patient. Um, whose um, sister had breast cancer as well, um, and whose father had a cancer. She tests positive, and then you can see the number of uh, female family members in the next generation uh, that, can, that can be impacted and potentially um, can have cancer prevented if we have this, inter uh, this um, information cascaded to them. Having said that, there are a lot of barriers to cascade testing. Um, and I go back to uh, Henry Lynch and, uh, you know, he used to drive a van uh, with his genetic counseling staff and they would go to family reunions. Um, and, uh, and that may end up being one of the most uh, effective ways of cascade testing because a lot of um, what we've done subsequently is, is really challenging and not that successful. I mean, if you kind of go through these uh, little little uh, kind of quotes, um, you know, my family didn't discuss the genetic test results for over 10 years. I didn't find out until after I was diagnosed with triple negative breast cancer. Um, my family uh, hasn't had testing because it's too difficult. Uh, money is so expensive. Um, some family members would like to get tested, but some have had difficulty getting insurance to cover it. Um, I want my daughter to get her own insurance before undergoing genetic testing. Um, travel and missing work, and my mom got denied by insurance, so how can she get genetic testing now? So there's multiple barriers that we hear from our, our uh, patients. You know, these can be kind of categorized. Family communication continues to be a, a barrier. Um, it's a burden to a patient who may be undergoing cancer treatment at the time. Uh, there's uh, often difficulties in terms of acceptance by family members. Um, you know, we're in a society where we're not as connected as we used to be. Um, the cost in the past was a huge issue, um, access to genetic counseling and genetic testing, um, and then systems issues. So um, even though um, the clinical team is caring for the proband, confidentiality prohibits us to reach out to the relatives um, unless we have permission uh, via the proband. So, you know, we wanted, we knew the benefit, um, but we also knew the barriers. Um, and I think that was kind of part of what drove us. Um, now, there's been a huge game changer. I think there's two game changers in the last, um, last decade. One is really around the therapeutics. And so now oncologists are really um, kind of have it in the top of their mind to do the genetic testing. I think the second is the dramatic decrease in the cost of sequencing. Um, and so for most of my career, genetic testing was around $4,000. Um, and now it's come down to about $250 to $300. So, it's really been um, a game changer in terms of how we think about uh, different ways of uh, delivering this, um, this medical test. So the lower cost of testing expands opportunities to address these barriers that we have in genetic testing. Um, and so, you know, um, you know, we thought about, well, what if we could do this just when someone's at home? 
They wouldn't require a doctor or clinic visit. It would be available anywhere in the U.S. And we know certainly we've got barriers uh, in rural communities and communities where they don't have access to genetic counseling um, and really kind of take advantage of this online um, experience with access to genetic counseling. So the question is, was it fe is it feasible and does it result in more distress and less knowledge? And so this is where Magenta, uh, Magenta stands for Making Genetic Testing Accessible. Um, this was submitted um, as part of a, a funding uh, to the Stand Up to Cancer um, funding mechanism. Um, it was a uh, ovarian cancer dream team that uh, I was very proud to be part of. Um, and it was funded by three groups. It was funded by Stand Up to Cancer, but also uh, NOCC as well as the Ovarian Cancer uh, Research Alliance. So very, very grateful for that funding. So the question was, can we deliver genetic testing to women in their home? Um, and also the question of how much genetic counseling is optimal. So we received our funding in April of 2015. And interestingly, Color, um, which has been one of the leaders um, in terms of this type of testing, um, also started their clinical testing in April of 2015. And so the question, um, it was interesting because as we were thinking about this, uh, you know, Color started, started its process. And um, in some ways, I think that that made it easier because it was less of a stretch for us to be doing a trial when it was already a, um, you know, kind of uh, clinically available to, you know, people uh, throughout the U.S. Um, you know, 23andMe, which is, um, I consider not really medical grade genetic testing, um, you know, had already had that paradigm of, you know, spit kits and, and sending, um, you know, sending uh, that in for DNA analysis. So, uh, in some ways, I think that the timing um, of this uh, made it um, uh, a little bit easier uh, to, to do this type of study. Um, in addition, I would say that um, I really appreciate the collaboration we had with Color. They were a new company. You know, we wanted to, to, to test this, uh, and they were, were really good about partnering with us. And so the question in some ways, because the, 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 the cat was already out of the bag, it was already available, uh, but we wanted to know, you know, how much of that counseling is really optimal. Um, we've gone from a paradigm of really doing genetic counseling in person, pre-test counseling, post-test counseling, um, to a system where essentially um, there was counseling uh, if you tested positive and counseling available and accessible, um, but it was a very different model. Um, so I'm going to talk now about the study design and some of the early regulatory hurdles that we had. Um, so the goal of Magenta is to compare a standard approach to genetic counseling, which, was, which we considered telephone counseling for both pre- and post-genetic testing, regardless of results to three alternative approaches, all of which included an online educational video uh, and online test results. Um, and we were able to do this in some ways because of the pioneering work of others. Um, so um, there was an important randomized trial showing that telephone counseling was non-inferior to in-person counseling. So that allowed us to use telephone pre and post counseling as our control arm. And this was a prospective randomized non-inferiority study. So we had four arms, and maybe I'll start with arm C. So arm C is our control arm. And so there was pre-test education both online, um, but also um, a, a genetic counselor did pre-test education. Um, and then um, uh, after results were obtained, regardless of those results, uh, everyone in arm C spoke to a genetic counselor. Um, and then uh, there was arm B and D. And so arm B, uh, you had your pre-test education just online, but your results release was through uh, a phone uh, conversation with a genetic counselor. And then arm D was the opposite. So you would have your pre-test education um, with, a, uh, it, with a counselor, and then your results release was online. And then arm A is where um, essentially um, I would say it's, it's the color model where there was pre-test education uh, and uh, results release um, was again online, um, 
in all of these circumstances in A through D, if you tested positive, um, the results were disclosed uh, with a genetic counselor. So we had uh, two cohorts, the family history cohort, which was the largest cohort <clears throat> that had um, that we estimated needed 2250 uh, uh, women. And then our cascade testing cohort, these are individuals who had a known mutation with 750. And this study was powered to show non-inferiority um, in the <clears throat> in actually distress um, at the three month time point. So in terms of eligibility, we um, this was uh, an ovarian cancer study, and so it was women age 30 and above. Um, no previous genetic testing or counseling. So if they had had genetic uh, counseling before and just couldn't afford the test, we actually excluded them because we wanted to, to um, we really focused on the counseling part of this. Um, the family history cohort, women were eligible based on a personal history of breast cancer or a family history of breast or ovarian cancer. The cascade cohort I said before, no mutation in the family. Um, no personal history of ovarian cancer. So this, this study was not for women that had ovarian cancer um, and the presence of at least one ovary. Um, and this is the website. And um, I really encourage you to go to the website. The study is closed, but you can watch the video. Um, so we created a video um, that uh, was really meant as a recruitment video, um, but uh, we're really proud of it. And um, I think that for anyone who's thinking about this type of study, uh, this is a really uh, nice way. We had a landing page that described it. We had a video, um, and then I think it was pretty obvious, you know, in terms of um, eligibility, there's kind of a, a box that says get started. Um, just some early issues that we had to address. The first one was uh, we wanted to do this. We really wanted uh, participation from all 50 states. So who was going to do the genetic counseling? So. Um, as you may or may not know, um, genetic counselors are licensed in most states. And so, you know, how do we get licenses in 50 states? So this study was based at MD Anderson. We had collaborators in New York, in um, Washington State, um, in uh, Minnesota. And so we were trying to figure out, okay, you know, if we have counselors in these states, then, you know, maybe the Texas counselors can get licenses in the states around them. And um, so we had kind of a very complex um, plan to do that. Um, and um, this is where kind of the collaboration with color really came into play. They were very, um, very helpful. You know, they have counselors, their counselors um, are licensed. They have counselors that cover all 50 states. Um, and so we worked with them um, to develop scripts that we would have for patients who would have the pretest and the post-test counseling. Um, and obviously they're all licensed genetic counselors and this was kind of their bread and butter. Um, but that collaboration really, um, I felt like kind of this study was all about barriers and kind of overcoming the barriers. Um, and so that was um, a big barrier that we were over, able to overcome. Um, the second is the security requirements for online consenting. Um, so our institution had never really done a study like this where um, consenting was done online. And so um, there were a lot of security requirements that we had to be careful about. Um, and so even for the um, for the eligibility questionnaire, you know, we, we considered that low risk. And so, you know, um, I'll show you in a minute where it says that if you fill out the eligibility questionnaire, you're essentially consenting to allow us to kind of assemble the data. Um, and then for the actual informed consent, um, there are rules that uh, require you to kind of create um, a username and password um, to uh, kind of um, give it additional protection that um, that it's not, you know, someone doing it for someone else. Um, and then finally, uh, there was an issue about how do we ensure uh, that the women who were participating could understand the risks and benefits when the consent process was online. And so, we had um, a, a email address and we had kind of a hotline that was available at any time. If women had questions about, uh, about the study and the consenting process. Um, and also we were asked to put in um, a series of just three questions that would address understanding of key parts of the study. And I'll show you those as well. Um, this is just kind of the, the flow of the study. Um, 
uh, and um, I will talk you through it quickly. Um, I wanted to put this in to show you kind of, you know, uh, even though we were supported by Stand Up to Cancer, um, there's never enough money to do a study. Um, and so we used REDCap, um, which we're very grateful to NIH to have that as an open source data management system. Um, we had, uh, we really um, have a lot of experience with REDCap and it was, um, it worked very, very well. Uh, we needed to connect that to color um, and in order to have that part of the process flow. Uh, and then the patient had to be kind of uh, pushed back to us uh, to complete the, the questionnaires. Um, and so we were able to do that um, fairly easily. So if you kind of start at the beginning of the arrow, a patient would complete the eligibility questionnaire to find out if they're eligible. They would read and sign the informed consent. They would complete the baseline questionnaire. And that was all in kind of the setting of REDCap. Um, and then they would get pushed to color. And under color, they would provide um, some additional information. Um, uh, they would um, get uh, their, uh, they would watch their video for pre-test education, or they would um, get counseling over the phone. Uh, they would receive a kit in the mail. They provide the saliva and send it back. Um, then they would receive their test results, and depending on what arm they were in, they were e either asked to set up a time to talk to the genetic counselor, or the results were released. And then they were sent back uh, to the red cap uh, kind of area to complete their questionnaires um, after their genetic test results. Um, our primary endpoint was at three months, but we're collecting data at one year and two years as well. So this is a this is a screenshot of the eligibility questionnaire, um, and you may not be able to see it, but the slide will be available. And basically, there's like a little button to push. I do consent. I do not consent. Uh, and this just authorizes us um, to kind of collate um, all the information about eligibility. Um, and then um, once they were eligible, they were asked to set up a username and a password, uh, and then they um, uh, were went to the informed consent area. Um, and then again, it's probably hard for you to see, but there are questions at the end, um, and they're basically true false questions. Um, I understand in this uh, study that I may learn that I'm at increased risk of developing cancer. Yes, no. Um, if I participate in the study, um, uh, I have to travel to a cancer hospital to have my genetic testing done. Uh, that's obviously false. And so these were, these were uh, our regulatory group asked us to include these questions as a way um, to kind of highlight um, that uh, someone actually had read the informed consent. So another unique aspect about this study is that it was completely um, driven, I would say, uh, in terms of recruitment uh, through social media. We're very, very grateful to our uh, patient advocates who were, um, you know, fully integral to the design of the study, the execution of the study. Um, so the Ovarian uh, Cancer uh, uh, Research Fund Alliance, the Minnesota Ovarian Cancer Alliance, or um, the NOCC, they all helped us to get the word out about this study. Um, and we have, um, hopefully we'll be able to publish the paper about the social media recruitment. It was really, um, really a, a very um, uh, important part of this type of study. And I would encourage anyone who's, do, who's thinking about this type of study to, to um, uh, you know, to reach out to us, we're happy to kind of go over that. Um, study outcomes, our primary outcome, and this was based on um, Schwartz's paper, which was that prospective randomized study that looked at telephone counseling compared to in-person counseling, um, looking at cancer risk distress um, using the impact of event scale at three months post-test. We had um, a number of secondary outcomes, and those included um, completion of testing, um, anxiety, depression, quality of life, and decisional regret. Okay, I'm going to go over some of the results of Magenta. These were presented at ASCO, um, and uh, we hope that we'll be getting the paper out in the next few months. Um, so we actually um, had 14,000 women uh, complete the eligibility questionnaire. Um, of those, about 6,500 were eligible. Um, and about 4,500 signed consent. Um, from this point, they had to complete a baseline questionnaire, which was about 70 questions and may have, um, may have uh, hindered some people from moving forward. Um, and so 3,800 of the 4,570 
completed the baseline questionnaire and were randomized. And so this is the denominator that we used. Um, in terms of completing their pre-test counseling or video, depending on what arm they were randomized to, 87% um, completed that. Uh, and then in terms of actually activating the kit, 85% um, of those individuals um, did uh, completed that. Uh, returned the kit, 84% returned the kit. Um, completed um, uh, post-test counseling uh, with 72%. Uh, and then in terms of completing the three-month questionnaire, uh, we have a pretty, um, little bit bigger drop-off than we would have liked. Um, so about 52% um, of the total number of individuals who were randomized um, completed their three-month questionnaire. And this data that I'm about to present to you is based on, 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 the, on these numbers. Um, so, in terms of the geographic distribution, we had enrollment in all 50 states, and we were really, really excited. Um, the study ran from August of 2016, so you remember we were funded in April of 2015, so it took about a year um, to kind of uh, hurdle over all the regulatory barriers um, and start the study, and the study went on for about three years. Um, the demographics are as listed. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but just highlighting that the um, the mean the median age was um, 44. Um, that um, about uh, three uh, percent had a personal history of breast cancer. That overwhelming, um, despite the fact that we did targeted ads towards a minority population, uh, but 91 percent uh, were white and. Um, 63% uh, um, uh, um, had any college and 26% um, had some post-college education. So it was a very well-educated um, uh, white population. Um, in terms of genetic test results, you can see that in the Cascade cohort, which you would expect, there was a 12% positivity rate. And in the family history uh, cohort, um, it was 5%. And you can see the, the breakdown of the different um, uh, mutations that were found. Um, this just gives you a little bit more of a detail of that. So um, together, um, BRCA1 and BRCA2 were present in 1% of the family history cohort um, and about 5.4% of the Cascade. And then this is our primary outcome, which was the stress at three months. Um, and, and basically each of the three experimental arms was non-inferior to the control arm for distress um, at three months. And then in terms of secondary outcomes um, in the cascade cohort, uh, the, the no uh, and the pretest only counseling were also non-inferior for distress at three months. Um, distress was not significantly different across the arm. Um, and overall, 19% of our participants um, had very high distress at three months, and this rate was not significantly different across the arm, and it was not significantly different from baseline to three months. So this was kind of the, in this population, this was kind of the, be the, the background. Um, we did have a, um, a safety uh, safety built in, and so um, when there was a when um, the distress score was above a certain number, uh, we automatically reached out by phone um, to the individuals, um, and uh, uniformly these individuals said, "Yes, I have distress. I had distress even before the study, uh, and it's being managed." Um, these were some other secondary endpoints: um, anxiety um, and depression. Um, and decisional regret, and there was no difference in any of the arms um, in any of these secondary outcomes. And then completion rate. Um, so um, I'm not sure what we kind of um, thought before this study, um, but uh, we had a pre-specified analysis to determine the non-inferiority, um, which was statistically significant. And in terms of test completion, we saw much higher test completion um, in arms A and B uh, versus the control arm and the, and the arm that had um, post-test counseling. 
Um, and so again, all patients with positive results had post-test counseling regardless of arm assigned. Um, the strength of this is, is that it was a large population across um, the entire country. It was a randomized design. It was powered for non-inferiority. Um, we have many secondary outcomes that were collected and, and we've only shown you kind of a small number of those. In terms of limitations, there was a relatively high loss of patients uh, from determination of eligibility to consent. Um, and then we have kind of some steady drop off from that time. Um, likely, this is a very knowledgeable population. The recruitment was through advocacy, through news media. Um, and we ended up with, a, um, even though we were trying hard not to have this happen, we ended up with a homogeneous, mostly white and highly educated group. Um, and again, we've had some drop off to three months follow up. Um, so the summary non inferiority was shown for the primary outcome of distress at three months in the family history cohort for all three arms versus the control. Um, the completion rate was highest in the two arms with no pretest counseling. Um, and these results support the use of a genetic testing paradigm providing individual, individualized post-tech genetic counseling uh, only for patients with positive results and for those patients who request additional counseling. Um, I just wanna to kind of show this. Um, we got this, um, so we have a Magenta email that was set up for patients who had questions about the process or, um, or um, I needed some additional help. Um, and then uh, we got this email, uh, which is pretty incredible. I'm just gonna read it out to you. It said, in June of 2006, I lost my mother to ovarian cancer. At the time, there was little known about the BRCA gene and my doctors did not encourage testing. Even as more evidence came out about the BRCA gene, I thought it wouldn't be me. My mom was the only person with cancer in our family. Um, she goes on to write, I've worked in the cancer world for more than 10 years and always thought it wouldn't be me. OCRFA posted on Facebook about the Magenta study and I remember thinking I should do this so I can know the process and encourage others. I signed up and within two and a half months, I found out I have a mutation in the BRCA2 gene. Shock, fear, denial, just a few feelings I went through. If it wasn't for all the signs that I needed to be tested and the ease of testing for the Magenta study, I probably wouldn't be tested. Now that I've processed um, this information, I consider myself lucky to know my risk. If I'm young and I have a wonderful hospital nearby. The Magenta study makes the process so easy that there really is no excuse for women to not get tested. I hope that you fill every seat in this study and women see how important it is to know your risk. Thank you for giving me the knowledge that can save my life. Um, so that was pretty powerful um, and very satisfying after, um, after kind of uh, working hard to get this study off the ground. Um, so I'm just going to spend a few minutes before we open it up to questions talking about next steps. Um, and so from this study, uh, the GENERATE study is um, uh, a study that we are very proud of that we've worked with their study team um, to kind of also help launch. Um, they are looking at cascade testing in pancreatic cancer patients. Um, they have um, an educational video. They have um, uh, they have a website, um, and they're testing whether kind of that process of uh, like of of uh, I'll call it like say the color process, um, and they're randomizing them to either that that straightforward process. Um, versus a process where there's also um, an interactive web-based HIPAA-compliant genetic education uh, that family members would partic participate in. Um, and I think that study will give us a little bit deeper information about, um, I think we can say, yeah, it doesn't cause distress, but the question is, you know, what is, um, does it, does kind of that pre-test genetic in-person live counseling help with um, other issues around knowledge and things like that. Um, so that's also sponsored by Stand Up to Cancer and is currently ongoing. Um, I think the other next step that's important to think about is, um, you know, kind of how do we get to medically underserved populations? We had a pretty robust um, uh, kind of social media plan uh, to address areas, um, I don't know how you do this on Facebook, but um, we have someone who kind of specializes in that, um, that was really um, trying to get this information uh, about the study sent to um, minority communities as well as rural communities. Um, and um, just wanted to say that it continues to be a challenge and I think this is an important uh, next step. Um, 
Uh, Dr. Alejandro Rojahane is uh, a faculty at MD Anderson, um, and he is working on a project called Ignite Texas, um, stands for Increasing Genetic Testing in Texas, um, where he's looking at cascade testing in different underserved communities and doing both qualitative work as well as um, uh, prospective trials to see if we can overcome that. So I'd be really open to hear if there are other people on the webinar that have been successful at that. Um, and then at the last five minutes, I just want to talk about, you know, we talked about kind of how this information, how our goal is to decrease mortality from cancer. And so when we put this grant together, you know, I think it's one thing to identify, but if you identify and you don't give options for prevention, um, I think you're only kind of going halfway there. Um, we know that we have a growing number of what we call pre-vivors, individuals who are at increased risk for cancer. Um, because they have a known uh, hereditary uh, gene mutation, um, and it's a management dilemma. Um, and we, right now, um, there are good guidelines that say that surgical removal of the ovaries and fallopian tubes are the cornerstone of prevention for high-risk women, that we recommend that by age 40, you have your ovaries and fallopian tubes out if you're BRCA1, and by age 45, if you're BRCA2. This is a pretty early time. Um, uh, to undergo um, menopause, uh, and even with hormone replacement, early menopause impacts uh, quality of life. Um, and so you may have heard that self-injectomy has emerged as a patient-driven choice for prevention. And just to give you a little bit of background about that, uh, we've learned over um, the past uh, 10 years that uh, BRCA-associated ovarian cancer is um, probably starts in the fallopian tube. Um, good evidence now to support that. Um, it turns out that, that the epithelial cells um, on the fallopian tube uh, kind of drip onto the ovary. The ovary is a nice kind of uh, warm and cozy place uh, for those abnormal cells uh, to grow. Um, but knowing that that is the case has uh, really driven this concept of self-injectomy. And the rationale, um, obviously, is that uh, the, we think that the majority of BRCA-associated serous cancers start in the fallopian tube, but also some clinical information that, um, that um, you know, women uh, are, are really, uh, some women are delaying having this surgery um, because they don't uh, want to go into premature menopause, even with hormone replacement. Um, in a community of BRCA previvors, uh, there was a survey uh, that we published um, that showed that 34% um, found that um, a small uh, risk of cancer was acceptable, and they were definitely interested in pursuing this concept of um, really two-step prevention where women would have um, a self-injectomy um, earlier and um, uh, delay uh, the ovarectomy. And so as part of the Stand Up to Cancer grant, uh, we had the Magenta study, and we also had the WISP study, um, which was a prospective multicenter study with eight U.S. sites. This was obviously non-randomized. We enrolled 300 women, um, and basically women could either undergo an interval self-injectomy and a delayed ophorectomy, um, or undergo kind of the standard RRSO. Um, and this was presented at the Society of Gynecologic Oncology um, in uh, 2019. Uh, and basically showed uh, that um, uh, that women who underwent the self-injectomy not unexpectedly had fewer menopausal symptoms, improved quality of life, and um, the sexual function data, we are analyzing it right now. Um, just wanted to say that this study um, was done in the U.S. A Dutch study uh, was uh, ongoing uh, simultaneously. We presented the studies together. We've actually looked at the data um, our primary endpoint was sexual function. Um, you know, none of the results are surprising, um, but this is important work. Um, uh, in, in terms of cancer efficacy, which is uh, fundamental, neither study was powered for that, um, and so that will really be the next step um, after these studies. Um, so in summary, um, a genetic testing model with online delivery of pre- and post-test counseling with telephone support for those who test positive and as needed was not inferior to the standard of care, which was phone counseling. Um, as cost decreases, we will see more and more people undergoing genetic cancer, testing for cancer and other diseases. Um, we consider that a good thing. Um, and in the future, um, we may all have our genomes tested 
So we can't just focus on kind of the identification piece. We also have to focus on how we're going to manage that risk. Um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Just want to acknowledge um, all of the groups and individuals that helped us uh, with these with these studies. Karen, thank you so much for that really enlightening presentation. I'm going to get right to the questions that we have. Um, one of the first questions is uh, about how you handled VUS results. And if there were any steps in place for the scenario that might occur uh, of a VUS becoming reclassified as pathogenic? Yeah, uh, great question. Um, so um, VUSs were reported out kind of in the same way that um, that uh, color does it um, through their standard system. Uh, so the information is there. And then um, uh, obviously for the individuals who were randomized to uh, the genetic counselor uh, that was explained to them. Um, that would be a great study, kind of follow-up study to follow that up long-term. Um, and uh, individuals in this study, if, the, if variants are reclassified, we will reach out to them. Great, that's good to know. Um, next question, um, was there a distribution of positive tests uh, similar among the four arms, given the differences in completion rates? Um, I don't know off the top of my head, um, but I will, um, uh, yeah, I, I don't know off the top of my head, so I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to say, I will look into that. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then a few questions about um, your thoughts about uh, sort of increasing for next studies and, and lessons learned, um, increasing diversity in the future. Yeah. And I know you mentioned the Ignite. Texas study, and that seems like a an excellent follow up um, to what your work involved from your from the Anderson colleague. But I was so touched by the example you gave of, of um, Dr. Lynch taking his, his down to family gatherings. <laughs> is that is that kind of a approach promising, or do you, do you have other thoughts about that? Yeah, I I mean I think that um, it is really challenging, and um, you know I really would encourage. Um, NCI to continue funding uh, this type of information. And, um, you know, I think that that we need to start from the very beginning. Um, you know, I don't know if there's even qualitative work around, you know, what are the barriers? It's such a relatively new field um, that, you know, kind of amongst, um, you know, uh, Black families, it's going to be different than Hispanic families versus, you know, kind of Asian families and rural areas. And so, um, I think there needs to be qualitative work as well um, as kind of trials done. Um, and then probably within parts of the country, there's going to be differences. Um, so really developing these kind of cohorts of uh, investigators who are interested in that, I think that um, is going to be important. Now, obviously, what I didn't, the slide that I didn't put on here is kind of the, you know, the Mary Claire King quote, um, that she gave in her Lasker Award um, that said that all women at the age of 30 should consider undergoing BRCA testing. So, um, you know, I think that that um, I, I think as someone in the field, I've been very incremental in terms of, you know, um, kind of the, the whole genetic testing paradigm and um, that one thing that I feel like I've learned from Magenta is that it really is putting it in the hands of women. Um, and uh, we were just shocked by kind of the, the enthusiasm that we had uh, for this study and the fact that we enrolled women from all 50 states. And it was, I mean, this was done on a shoestring budget um, and it was really social media that drove it and our advocates. Um, so, you know, I think that um, there has to be more work done on, you know, kind of what makes cascade testing successful. Um, but there are certainly good studies that have shown that general population testing is something that, um, you know, that, that can be done. Um, and so I think that it'll be interesting to see, you know, in, in five years or 10 years. Uh, like I said, I just wanted to put out there that, um, 
you know, that we may all have our genome tested around multiple different things and not just cancer. And then it doesn't become like, what is your risk? It becomes, how do you manage that risk? Which I think is just such an important uh, partnered question um, with, with the risk question. Yeah, so true, and particularly given the uh, direct-to-consumer field and that's the expansion of that. I mean, there's yeah. so much genetic data that's just proliferating now um, for everybody. Um, so uh, next question, for the group that had uh, no telephone counseling and only online um, mm -hmm. counseling, uh, were, were there any state regulatory requirements for disseminating results that pertain to um, distributing genetic testing online, distributing results online? No. And I, and I wonder if, um, uh, not that there aren't, but I think that the fact that we did this, um, you know, that color was kind of had the platform to do this probably made it easier. So could we have done this, you know, five years before? I think it would have been a lot harder because probably, you know, color overcame a lot of those barriers that we would have had to do as a kind of study team that would have made it more difficult. Right, but that also suggests that if we move eventually to more of an online paradigm, that takes care of one problem, right? Which is getting well, and uh, I think that this whole approval for all the counselors. Yeah, yeah, and I think the whole COVID thing. I mean, gosh, if there is a silver lining out of COVID, it's that there's so many things that we thought that we could not do online that we're doing online, and it's fine. Um, and so I think that that, um, you know, that will probably uh, help to drive things as well. Okay. Um, what was your estimated budget for collecting genetic testing at home? Um, so, uh, we did not, so um, even though we worked very closely with color and extremely grateful, um, we, uh, it was, this was not a color sponsored study at all. Um, uh, we paid kind of um, the standard price uh, for the genetic testing. Um, uh, so, uh, so you could just calculate about $200 times, um, times the number of, of uh, tests that, uh, that were run. Okay. Uh, and for the family history cohort, did you see a difference in the mutation spectrum if the history was breast versus ovarian? Um, so we haven't uh, we haven't dug uh, deep enough into into that, um, but uh, yeah, I, I imagine that there will be, um, and uh, um, we'll need to dig a little bit deeper into that. Yeah, that will be interesting. A follow up um, question from this person: are, um, are there any plans to follow the women in the study to measure rate uh, the rate of women undergoing risk reduction surgery? Yes. So, um, so right now we're following them for two years, um, but of course we would love to continue to follow them um, and, uh, um, you know, and really, really see if they made made kind of health choices, um, both the positives and the negatives, right? Um, because all of these women had a family history um, of either breast or ovarian cancer. Um, so, kind of, um, you know, understanding their choices. Um, would be helpful regardless of their test results. Uh, and how often did you get calls on the toll-free number um, uh, versus via email from uh, participants during the consenting process? Yeah. Um, the, I would say surprisingly less than we thought. Um, the times that we ran into problems were, um, so even though social media probably was like the foundational piece that allowed us to, um, you know, to really reach, um, you know, women all across the country, I'll tell you what like was really effective is that there were um, a few uh, TV um, pieces where local TV stations uh, ran stories on the study and either interviewed someone who had gone through the process and say tested positive. Um, uh, and then there was another one um, where it was someone who was a, um, um, a news anchor and she had a family history. And so she actually went through the process and did a, a, did a um, kind of a segment where she was going through the process. Um, and so those two um, segments caused these huge spikes 
um, in, I think one was in Minnesota and one was in Michigan. And so that kind of like almost crashed our system. And so for a while, um, especially because, right, um, it was randomized to arms where you needed a genetic counselor. Um, and so uh, we ran into a situation where people were wanting to do it, but um, uh, you know, they, couldn't, they couldn't make an appointment to, to kind of get a, get a counseling session and things like that. So those were the times that we had um, the most people reaching out to us. But other than that, from a baseline standpoint, um, uh, I think that uh, it, we had surprisingly few people um, reach out to us. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, okay. Uh, for individuals in the arm who um, receive their post-test counseling online, um, but and and um, the results were negative. Was residual risk accounted for and communicated to them? In other words, if they were higher risk based on family history with the high management. Um, yeah, um, that's always a part. Um, if if you've kind of taken a look at you know any of the companies that um, that use this model, um, you know they kind of have those caveats in there. Um, now whether people truly, truly understand that, I think that's another area that needs to be studied. Um, you know, I think we had a, a large study that looked at, you know, kind of um, distress and was really based on that short study. Um, but I think there are so many details that, um, that can be um, studied even more deeply. Um, and that is an example of, of one, um, you know, the, v, the VUS is um, a great example. The other one is where someone has a strong family history, but no mutation is found. Those are kind of specific scenarios that I feel like need additional study. Yeah, with the negative result of a family history, is that that's mm -hmm. the plate language then that would have gone to everybody with that outcome. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. Correct. Um, so it is, I think, a great question to, um, to learn how much people get from that. Um, as opposed to a, a dialogue um, issue. Um, how did you identify cutoffs for outcomes that represented non-inferiority beyond borrowing them from the short study outcomes that you also used? And is it hard to identify rationale when establishing them at baseline? Yeah, um, I, I would say that, um, you know, like I think anytime you do these types of studies, I mean, I feel lucky that, you know, um, that wonderful group did the study because I think we were able to kind of look at the instruments that they used, the statistics, and um, and base it off of that. Um, you know, I think that that um, you know all of these studies are kind of going into uncharted territory, and so you kind of have to make your cutoff at at certain points, and you base it off of of, of prior work. Um, you know, I think that that um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great question and um, really depends on thoughtful statisticians um, and collaborators to, to think through those, those issues. Okay. Um, can you comment on whether there was a difference in the understanding of genetics and genetic testing sort of generally um, among participants who had the in-person pre-test counseling versus the online? So that we will, um, we're going to dig into that. Um, so we did have a questionnaire around knowledge, um, but if you've ever looked at some of these knowledge questionnaires for genetic testing, uh, it's hard to really kind of get at some of the subtlety, um, but we did ha use a validated questionnaire um, on knowledge. And so we'll dig into that. Um, there, there'll be lots of kind of, um, kind of uh, uh, information to come out of uh, of this, and, and for sure, that's one of the one of the areas that um, that we're interested in. Uh, and how did you decide to go with color um, as the company um, to uh, uh, model for your the, which genes to include and and, and their yeah. their test dissemination? Yeah, uh, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I think that um, you know uh, we had no no particular you know, reason to, to use one company over the other. Um, uh, Color was one of the ones that was kind of at, at the forefront of doing kind of, you know, spit kit testing and uh, obviously kind of medical grade, what we, I consider medical grade, um, you know, uh, testing. Um, the, one of the, the questions that we asked ourselves is that, you know, we were an ovarian cancer study and um, the way we wanted to do it initially was to really focus on ovarian cancer genes. 
Um, and so color was using kind of a broader panel. And so we had talked about, well, can you suppress the, the other information? And, um, and ultimately kind of one of the things that we decided is that, you know, look, like this is what is out there in the marketplace already. Um, and I think that is always a challenge like for academics is that we want to kind of really control things carefully um, and um, uh, versus kind of what's already in the marketplace. And so we ultimately decided, you know what, like we're just going to use what's out there already because that is important for us to, you know, um, again, that whole concept of the cat's already out of the bag. Um, and so for us to say we only wanted to study these few genes um, didn't seem like by the time, you know, kind of, again, we started this in 2016. So, you know, four years later, you know, you see panel testing all over. And so um, I think that that was the right decision, but that was kind of one of the decision-making points that we struggled with um, as well. Yeah. Uh, and, and to your point about um, utilizing the uh, understanding questions, mm -hmm. Um, how often were they answered falsely and what um, response did that trigger by the study? Did you ever eliminate any um, eligible individuals for lack of understanding? Um, we, I don't know that right now, but the question, the way it works is that if you got it wrong, you could try again. So it wasn't necessarily meant to, um, I think if you were persistent, you know, you could, you know, you could get through it. Um, they were, it was uh, like, if you click and you got it wrong, it would say this is incorrect. Um, so it wasn't, I wouldn't say a kind of a, a, a stopping point where you couldn't participate in the study. And, and are you going to be able to um, gather data on how often people um, were asked uh, when, when they needed repeated efforts to get the answer right? And is that data that you can um, at some point? Yeah, you know, I think that the most interesting uh, part, which, um, you know, we'll dig into it, but I don't know if we're going to be able to glean, you know, kind of as deep an amount of information as we would like is the drop off. You know, so why did we have such a big drop off between, you know, kind of eligibility uh, and actually kind of signing consent? Um, and so for people who, who are doing this type of study, you know, that would be helpful to know, like, is it is it because you kind of couldn't get through the consent form? You couldn't figure out how to do the username and the password and, you know, kind of get through the questions. Does that eliminate a group of people that you would want to include? Um, you know, what about the other really interesting point of drop off is where you've actually gone through all that. Um, you've actually gotten your kit, but then you don't send your kit back. Is that because now, you know, like you could imagine that the individuals who have, you know, kind of telephone genetic counseling, maybe have a deeper understanding of like that gray zone of what the information could mean. Um, and maybe they, you know, you had more people who are like, you know what, I'm not going to do it. It's not the right time in my life to do it. So those kinds of subtleties we would love to get at, but I'm not sure if, you know, kind of this type of study is going to be able to give us, you know, that level of detail. Yeah. Um, did you have any information on the insurance status of your population? You clearly had a very highly educated um, set of uh, individuals in your cohort. So yeah. just wondering about insurance status. Um, that's a great question. And I don't know off the top of my head, but I will check. I think we do. I think that was kind of the standard demographic question. Yeah. Um, and was the completion rate different for the Cascade versus the positive history cohort? Uh, yes. Uh, let me see if I can pull it up really quickly. Uh, actually, I don't have it right at my fingertips. Um, but I think it was. I think that I think the um, I think there was a difference. Uh, but I'm hoping that we get our manuscript out in the next couple months. Um, and and I think that those those types of um, that type of information will be will be in the in the paper. Well, we we will all look forward to that. And we will also um, we we do have a, a bunch of questions that we are um, I can tell already not going to get to, but no worries. We will um, funnel all of those to Karen and um, see about getting answers back to people. Rich, I think we have time for um, one final question. 
Um, someone writes, concern that men were not included in the cascade testing. Was there any consideration for men who are at risk also were passed along? Yeah, it sounds like a great study for someone who is listening on this webinar. Um, so we were focused on uh, women at risk for ovarian cancer and um, you know, the, uh, the GENERATE study is men and women. So I think that is for uh, individuals who have relatives with pancreatic cancer. Um, but yeah, it should absolutely be done in men as well. Great. Well, Karen, thank you so very much for your time and sharing your study with us today. Um, I, I do, I, I know we're coming up on the hour, so I, I want to be mindful of everyone's time and thank you all for attending. Um, keep an eye out for future and rich events. Our next presentation is on October 20th. And Dave Wendler from the NIH Department of Bioethics will be speaking on um, his work um, and recent publication involving the claims of biospecimen donors to credit and compensation. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Thank you, Dr. Lou, for your insights, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Until then, stay safe and be well. Thank you. Thank you.